Hello everybody and um, welcome to this professional development webinar brought to you by the Fashion Network. Uh, this session is a range planning masterclass and uh, we will be looking at it from a fashion and apparel perspective. Uh, before we start, um, just a few kind of house rules. If you have any questions or comments, um, please leave them in the chat box. Um, we do want to keep this discussion as interactive as possible, so please do get involved. Um, alternatively, if your question is kind of long or complex, <clears throat> or if you're like me, you don't like write, writing reams of text, then there is a little feature, uh, a raise your hand feature that you can click on. Um, and that will allow uh, us to uh, switch your audio feed on and you can speak to our chair and our panel uh, directly. Um, alternatively, there will be also a post uh, event networking session and you can kind of speak to us that way. So, but either or you can, you can interact with us uh, in several different ways. Um, as this is a, an exclusive event, this will not be going live on YouTube. Um, however, we will update the recording at a later date if any of you want to catch up with it. Um, what would be really good for us, though, uh, and the panellists and uh, today's chair is if you could just let us know uh, where you are in the world and what job role you do. So if you can pop that in the chat box, just let us know where you are and what job role you do. If you're a student, just let us know what course you're studying. Uh, just be interesting um, for, for us and the panellists to, to have an idea of who they're talking to. Um, I'm just going to introduce today's chairperson and um, Lisa Trencher is a senior lecturer uh, uh, in fashion business at the Manchester Metropolitan University. She will be chairing today's discussion. Um, and on today's panel, we have uh, Lee Gallagher, uh, Trend and Design Director at LG Trend and Design Consultancy. Sean Hume is a senior merchandiser at M Brown Group. Uh, Rick Bowen, menswear merchandiser at M Brown Group and Bethany Hack, retail strategist at Edited. Um, before I hand over to Lisa, though, we're going to publish a quick poll uh, just to get the thoughts of you out there in the audience. So just let us know what you guys think. Is range planning an art or a science? So you've only got two options, so it shouldn't take you long to click on one of those. So if you can just let us know what you think. I think the panelists, I think you guys have an opportunity to um, to to, um, to 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 uh, interact with that as well. So just let us know. I've just voted. Um, yeah, art or science, uh, and my colleague Scarlett will publish that in a moment when you've all uh, voted. Just be intriguing to know what you guys out there think. Anyway, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Lisa. Lisa is today's chair. Uh, Lisa, you'll have the, the poll published. There we go. Here's the result there. So it's fairly close. So anyway, Lisa, I'm going to hand over to you and hopefully see you all after the talk. OK, thanks, Dale. Um, OK, so um, great to, to um, have you all online with us today for this uh, masterclass in range planning. So I guess we'll start at the beginning, as in, where do you start with a range plan and sort of what the strategic considerations? So we'll go to Rick for that question. Uh, yeah, so um, where we'll start with the range plan. So we're constantly having conversations about it. So it's, it's, it's ongoing uh, discussion within M Brown, but we do have two touch points a year. So every six months we'll, we'll do um, a range planning, what we call a range control and strategy meeting. Uh, we have a spring, summer and autumn winter meetings. Um, and they're generally um, eight months before the start of the season. And it's just a big swat of, of what's happened previously and what's going on within the market. So within that, we'll have um, design, buying and merchandising and all come together to do this. Um, design will bring trend analysis um, from what's happened within the market, what's going on, what happened historically as well. Um, and they'll bring lots of visual representations, of what colours out there and what, what things are happening and what's worked well for us. Uh, lots of CADs, lots of CAD range boards, that sort of thing, loads of ideas. Um, merch will bring along like a, a plan, a historical plan, um, more sort of data, um, such as like option counts uh, per launch phase, rates of sales, the markdown uh, we achieved or, or the markdown we spent, returns rate, right through to like the uh, margin that we achieved. And then the buyer will have an idea on like the supply base, who they want to use um, for the certain products that we're, that we're ranging, country of origin, target prices, RRPs, that sort of thing. And we'll all come together and work a plan together. Ah, that's great. That. So Bethany, in terms of the sort of 
historical analysis and the sort of post-season, uh, you know, post-mortem, if you like. How important is that? And is it is it becoming more important as we as we have access to more data, et cetera? Yeah, it's a great question. So post-season analysis and historical um, analysis is super important. I think it's channeling that old phrase of you have to look back to move forward, right? Um, lessons learned is really important. Um, so as Rick touched on, um, in my old merchandising role, there were various different indicators that I would look at to assess whether I'd had a good season or a bad season. So looking at whether your sales beat plan, beat forecast, whether your markdown came in at the level that you expected, what stock you've got left over to carry through to next season. Again, how was that based on your plan? Um, exit margin and profits, average covers and rate of sales. And also you would look at this sometimes by channel, so by store, by digital, and obviously sometimes even going through to category levels. Um, you also have meetings in your um, hindsighting um, time period in retail. Often they're called lessons learned and they might be named something else in the, in, in the brands that you guys work in. But um, these were very collaborative meetings. So this is where you would look through, you know, what was hot in your range, what wasn't, um, what your top sell throughs were, where you drove full price sales, top volumes and top profit drivers as well. So looking at those stars that really kind of gain you the money, which is more important now than ever with costs rising everywhere. You wanna make sure you've got good margin on your products. Um, but one challenge I always felt like I, I guess came across a lot within my previous merchandising role was a lack of external information. Um, so now where I work at Edited, Edited is a really powerful market intelligence platform, which lets you map out the entire retail market in an instant. So really supportive with helping you streamline decision-making and helping you spot gaps in the market to turn into big gains. So I would then use edited in my previous role to understand what was happening in the market. So those misses that you had in your range, were they seen as a market trend? Um, that product that didn't perform well for you, did it not perform well for your competitors or actually did it? And why was that? Was it made from a different fabrication? Was it at a cheaper price point? You can gain all of these sorts of great pieces of analysis to put the whole story together. Um, we spend a lot of time looking internally and the power of the data is real. So using it to your advantage is important. I mean, um, I actually worked with a global US heritage brand recently on hindsighting their T-shirt range. And simply through analyzing edited, they noticed that they hadn't had any Supima or Pima cotton in their T-shirt range where their direct competitors did. So that's now, I guess, um, channeled into their strategy for next season. So that's the kind of decisions you can make from these hindsighting pieces. So this is the science bit really kicking in. Yes. More important as we get to, to have access to this data through things like edited. That's really interesting, actually. So if we take all those lessons learned and we think about our historical analysis, et cetera, et cetera, I suppose the next thing to think about is the design and research phase. So Lee, would you like to just take us through uh, the importance of that in range plan and how that works? Sure. So from a trend uh, forecaster and design perspective, I also have to look at the historical um, context of the brand as well. So I'm also looking at, you know, within those brand guidelines and within their brand DNA, like who's their um, target consumer um, and what do they actually do really well? What do they want to sell well? So that I can actually, when I look at the trends, um, I can bring in the brand DNA as a filter so that I know which trends I can filter down that's going to work for a specific type of brand. So from a trend perspective, I would look at the key colors, the key fabrics, key shapes, key graphics, but I'd also look at social factors as well with regards to social trends. So say, for example, your target consumer was Gen Z, you know, looking at the lifestyle and behavior factors that influence as to why they want to shop from that brand or want to be loyal to that brand. Then it's also about looking at the historical performance of the brand. So understanding of, you know, what product areas have worked in the past and then what product areas have opportunity for growth and what trends can actually play well into those areas so that you can really grow those areas. So it's about really understanding that consumer and from the consumer's perspective of, you know, are they an innovator or are they um, someone who likes to see a fashion trend on someone else before them? Do they want to see that and be second um, in wearing it? So that really helps me from the perspective of 
the timing of when I want to drop trends. So if I don't want to be first in market, that's an opportunity for someone else who is first in the market to drop the trend. And then we can feed into it later in the season. Fab. So in terms of then, I guess, bringing in newness to a range, I suppose that depends on your consumer, your brand. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I think newness is very important, but I think what's really important is that you have your foundations of your core range. And so if that's protected, then you can play around with the newness. So in one of the brands that I used to work for, we worked on kind of like a pyramid. So it was basically your core was the bottom of the pyramid, then the middle was your fashion, and then on the top would be your newness. So that was normally split with regards to your core would take up approximately like 60% of the range then 30% would be based on fashion. And then the top 10% of that pyramid was seen as like the icing on the cake. So basically that's where you can play around with your newness. So from a margin perspective, your core would normally make 80% of the margin and your fashion would normally make over 70%. Then at the top of the pyramid with your little eye candy pieces, icing pieces, that's where you can take a hit in your margin. But these are the real hero pieces that can draw in consumers from a fashion perspective. They're the ones that you can put on Instagram, you can put on your campaigns. Um, so it's really important to have those fashion pieces in there from a news perspective. Um, but that's when we normally clash with a lot of the merchandisers because they don't make margin, um, but they are still very important to have in there from a newness perspective. I think what's really important as well is that, you know, you don't forget about that your core is protected. You still have to bring newness into that core range as well. So a way of doing that is obviously to have a really good assortment of color. So bringing in some of the seasonal colors with a really good mix of fashionable colors so that you can really move on that core piece, but it's still protected. So it's still going to make your sales target, but then playing around at that top part of the pyramid with playing around with new colors, new fabrications, so that you can really move on that range. Fab. So once we've got this newness and we're building this in, how do we sort of decide on, you know, um, the the structure of the of the range in terms of the number of garments, the tops to bottoms ratio and things like that. Sean, would you have a yeah. some insight into that? Yeah, no problem. I totally agree with what Lee's just said in terms of the pyramid. And it's kind of a similar thought process for the number of garments per range, really. Uh, so as as um, Lee said about the pyramid structure, you call your fashion and your newness in terms of what, what on lingerie for my area that I look after at M Brown, for instance, core is quite a heavy proportion of the mix but for instance rick's range within menswear may may be you know maybe 50 percent core and then 50 percent trends just for an example but what we do as merchandisers is bank off those core sales first so we would use things like um pareto analysis which is where you'd have you know you 80% of your cash, for instance, for the for a whole season with the bottom 20 and the bottom 20 would be deemed kind of, you know, risk for future seasons if they had the poorest sell through or the poorest kind of conversion rate. So what we do is we'd kind of go 80%. This is exactly what we need to bank off with that 20% of, you know, that's what we can play around with and kind of as Lee described the newness or the, the kind of trend or the fashion area. Um, we would literally go in on a line by line basis and say, OK, this style, are we going to do that next year? Yes, because it took X amount of cash. We can't afford to you know, possibly drop that from the range and risk it. So it could be that we look at that 80, 20 or even like Lee said, the pyramid structure to say um, we want to bank off 50, 50 of these styles in core, 20 is you know, fashion and then another 10 or 15 percent for for the for the uh, the pure newness that we can test and trial because as as Lee said again just in terms of the core range my my range on bras for instance is is very heavily core doesn't change that much but there may be a trend on the way that says okay in three to four years time there's a new type of bra that comes in and then overtakes you know and and you you kind of phase it phase it through uh, and keep refreshing and keep that customer engaged um, in terms of the different types. Uh, of garments within the range. I think Bethany was going to uh, tie in with me on that one. Yeah, um, absolutely. So again, completely agree with what's already been said. I also think something to consider 
with what we're seeing at the market in the market here at edited is that option planning may really kind of change over the next few months based on the supply chain so we're seeing um across the market that a lot more retailers are now focusing on restock um, of options or trading back into options that worked previously to cut time and kind of positioning this to their customers as a new drop in clever communications. And also a lot of retailers now are try trialing pre-orders as well, guys. So that's something to kind of keep an eye on as well in the market um, and could shape your strategy. So um, that yeah, really supports, yeah, carry on. <laughs> that, that, no, sorry, that's just a really no. good point that we've literally just come out of the meeting today to give you a live example of that, of Nightwear, mm -hmm. Chris, Christmas and Novelty Line. So we have really struggled to land our Christmas package on nightwear this season just due to the freight delays that you know have been well documented across globe you know globally really mm -hmm. uh, and we are taking pre-orders on those up to two weeks just before christmas to ensure that we aren't left with a stock package at the end of it so exactly yeah there's live examples of that going on as we speak so um yeah. pre pre pre-orders i think with all of the freight issues and delays are something that are going to come back into play mm -hmm. definitely absolutely I think as well, because, you know, you you wouldn't think of that when you're naturally talking about a range plan, would mm -mm. you? So, Sean, in terms of your ranges then, in terms of your <laughs> lingerie, so are there sort of, you know, um, ranges of bras, but then are the capsule collections as well? And how does that differ in terms of your range planning? Yeah, so in terms, so obviously get, going back to that, you know, very rigid, you know, we bank our core off because our, our course, our core staples within the range do take between 60 and 70% of the cash. So there is only that 30% worth of capsule. So one range that we brought in this year on the back of all of the great work um, that, you know, the industry has done in terms of more diverse styles, such as, um, we, we have our skin tone range so we what we haven't done before the start of this year was open up a variety of different colors for every type of skin tone and every type of gender and every type of um you know demographic we we then brought in that offering within january this year and that's something that we've never trialed before so we had seven seven different uh, skin tone types and that's something that we're continuing with and that that would be for us be classed as a capsule range so that would have sat within our newness sector rather than a fashion because that's something that we're bringing in that we've never tested and trialed before and on the back of you know kind of all of the great work that's been done within that sector in terms of you know empowerment across all kind of diverse and genders yeah and that inclusivity as well and um, there's a, just a question from denali in the uh, in the chat and um, so lee i wonder would you be able to answer this how would you define core as it could be a bright colorful product so just in terms of what you define as core i think it, it depends on the brand to be honest like sean mentioned with his it's his core takes is taken up by his bra range um, for the company that I used to work for, we were based in Australia, so our core actually fluctuated between seasonality. So our core in spring, summer, for example, was a lot of like crop tops, um, tanks, um, bike shorts. But then when it flipped to um, what was considered their winter, it went into a lot of fleece pieces of like core hoodies, core sweat bottoms. So I think it's just kind of, you know, you'll definitely have still bright colors in your core. Um, but it's those ones that are your, your bread and butter of your range that you know you sell well within seasonality. So you sort of go to shapes and silhouettes, if you like. Correct. And denim as well is obviously a very core product as well. So if your company is very much a, a denim retailer, then you're going to have a lot of denim pieces that will run through its core all through all seasons as well. Great. Thanks, Lee. So in terms of, Lee, if we stay with you, in terms of fabric considerations and colourway, you just touched on it. How does that play a part in your range? In your range? I think um, that's where we always come to have a bit of a clash with the merchandising team, mm -hmm. because from a fashion perspective and design perspective, we're always wanting to do the newest things, the newest fabrications, new innovation. Um, but obviously what comes with that is a lot of cost um, challenges. Um, so it's really important that we really come together and work on that so that we can actually input some of that newness and innovation. Um, but it also throws up, you know, can your suppliers work with this different type of fabrication? What's your cost coming, going to come out? What's the hit to your margin? 
I think we had the perfect marriage with um, design and merchandising a couple of seasons ago when the um, massive trend for Gorbcore, which was like that outdoor trend of like, you know, influenced by Patagonia and North Face. So it was basically when like practical outdoor fabrics came back into trend. So I was like, oh, well, Polar Fleece is now like a, a trend fabric again. And they're like, well, absolutely. Polar Fleece like has always been in the, you know, the range with, with trend from a long time ago. So it's cheap. So I'm obviously getting the benefit of having a, a now on trend fabric again, um, but it's also coming into cost as well. So I think that's how we have to kind of work around it is like, you know, we need to bring that newness in there, but if it comes to a perfect marriage like that, it works even better. So Rick, perfect marriage with the design team and the buying team in terms of colours and fabrics considerations as you're moving through trying to find that balance of commercial, protecting your core and some fashion. How do you find managing that? Yeah, I definitely agree with what Lee was saying. Um, we do have some, uh, you know, friction between the two teams, should I say. Um, I, I work on predominantly on men's wear. I always have done so. I mean, men, we just wear black and navy all the time. So trying to get the colour to come through in the rain is very difficult. Um, but what we've seen, you know, we, we will try it and it comes back to that pyramid. We'll use the pyramid as well for colours. So your core colours will be black and navy at the bottom of the pyramid. Going up to what we've got in now, we've got like some burnt oranges and that sort of thing. So we'll look at it in the pyramid view as well on, on colour. Um, what we've started to see is that the, the colours are coming through quite strong actually on menswear now as well. So they will start to wear more, more colour. And what we do is we do it on we do it on a test and trial basis. So we'll test test the colours first. And if they work, they'll move through the ranks and maybe get promoted. Don't normally get into the, the core range where we'll run it all season, but they normally they can get promoted into the, the second phase of the, the pyramid, should I say, when we're repeating when we're repeating on these colours. Well, so it's a compromise with everything, isn't it? Yeah, fabulous. Correct. Lisa, just, just yeah. talking on fabrications as well, I think it's been really interesting to watch how fleece has really evolved. So obviously we've been following fleece for several seasons, going back to when Yeezy even had his impact of like tonal colours from head to toe and with the mass, like macro trend of comfort and oversized silhouettes. And this was all before pre-pandemic. Um, and now that the pandemic has obviously we've gone through having our work uniform of wearing fleece pieces at home. The biggest challenge now is how do we actually move that fabrication forward because people want to see that as being a comfortable fabric, but still from a fashion perspective. So as we return to work and get out of our work uniform, how do we actually elevate that fabrication? How do we move it on and keep it relevant for our consumer? That's interesting, yeah. So, you, you know, we don't think of so much in depth about fleece, do we? But obviously, it's creating that newness again we were talking about before. Great, that, that's great, thanks. Sean, let's get on to the money side. Yep. So, your costings, your RRP and your margin. So, obviously, you know, how do you structure that within your, your thinking, within your range? Yeah, so, uh, well, we, we have a tier which we call good, better and best in terms of retail price. Uh, I think most most kind of companies would have that. Obviously, the best would be the, uh, you know, the higher quality kind of garments with the higher or the, the more expensive retail prices, should I say. Uh, your better range would be that mid, mid to uh, top end price point when, with the good being your kind of OPP, which is your opening price point or your, your, your staples, really. So, Within uh, menswear, for example, it'd be your core basic T-shirts, for instance, would be would sit into that core range. Uh, but just in terms of costings, the, so there's two types of costings what we deal with, and that's FOB and it's landed. So an FOB cost price in terms of just pure definition uh, is freight on board. And that's usually given by your Far, far East suppliers uh, who'd give you a dollar price for this. Uh, for, for example, you know, $10 for a T-shirt. Uh, and then that would incur additional costs on top of that. So you'd have your freight, which is your mode of transport, which you know, usually for us at M Brown is uh, via sea. So they go into containers on uh, shipping vessels. And then you pay your duty on top of that, which is uh, your VAT uh, on importing the goods to the UK, which then turns into a landed cost price which then you'd obviously have your landed cost price, which may be, you know, that $10 may turn into £15 as a, just as, a, as, a, as an example. And then if you had that £15 and your sale price was £30, your margin would be 50% on that product. So 
Um, but the, the other example of a cost price is a landed cost price. Uh, and that's often used um, where the supplier is UK based or you're getting it direct from an agent, for example. So an example of this at the moment is uh, we use Kelvin Klein and Brown but on ladies brands. Uh, and they're actually based in the UK, but they source their product from all over the world. Um, you know, they might <coughs> it may be made in China, uh, but it you know, comes in, it gets branded through Kelvin Klein and then is sold to us. Uh, as a landed UK uh, cost price. And then again, we'd, we'd apply our RRPs to that. Uh, and then based on the cost and the sell price, that would give you your actual cash margin. Um, but in terms of, uh, and obviously overall for the start of a season, um, we would give ourselves uh, a BIM, so a buy-in margin, which is that, um, that kind of target for the, it's usually the buy-in side, to be honest, to hit. Uh, so. You know, for instance, a buy-in margin target for, I don't know, ladies branded lingerie for my area, for example, maybe 47, 48% for it, for, for a range, for example. Um, and then obviously we've got uh, issues at the moment in terms of raw material costs, freight, freight increases going up due to lack of containers. Uh, so where the cost kind of goes up in terms of your FOB price or your landed cost price, unfortunately, uh, due to you know, various reasons that cost is often passed on to the customer through your sell price and um, so I know across the industry not just for M. Brown there has been pieces or exercises in terms of how much would it cost uh, to put your selling prices up by one or two pounds to negate those costs that's not just us that's you know across the board I think we've already seen it in the likes of you know stores such as Matalan and Next and places like that have, have already started targeting things like that so it's not just going to be online retail it's very much store based as well because uh, you know the, the freight issues and the, the rising costs of garments and raw materials is is going up by 20 and 30 percent in, in some cases uh, but the, the basis is that good better best and agreeing for your range and for your customer what do you think you can get out of that? Fab. So for any young budding merchandisers, I guess the tip, the biggest tip there is make sure, you know, if your price is FOB or landed when you're putting it into your spreadsheet, that's a, a key one. And then obviously um, what we're seeing now probably is, is how the supply chain is really impacting um, the range planning. So Bethany, could you give any insight in terms of supply chain and then how, you know, maybe this links to quantities and lead times and from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously, as we know, the industry is facing unprecedented circumstances um, and has been for two years for various reasons, COVID and now supply chain issues. Um, but um, there are multiple different things that you can use um, edited data um, to kind of really cement in your minds when you're range planning. Um, and that's what we're seeing a lot of retailers using us for right now. Um, so one thing is um, pricing. So as um, Sean mentioned, pricing of shipments have actually increased hugely. Um, I think the data that I've got here is that um, a ship that used to cost two grand is now costing £23,000 um, versus 2019. So that's a huge increase. So what a lot of retailers are doing is using edited data to kind of analyse how retailers are hiking up prices and where. So some retailers might not pick to put their prices up across their whole range. They might actually choose, especially high street retailers, to focus this price increase in core ranges or in ranges where the price might not seem so dramatic to the consumer um, so that's a really big consideration that a lot of retailers are using tools in our system like the pricing over time or um, discounting as well to kind of keep on track of um, Another thing as well that's really important to consider as well is the sourcing of your products. So from a general perspective, um, a lot of retailers had already been resourcing a lot of their production to nearer to home because of the COVID pandemic. So those retailers who have done that are probably in a better position than those who didn't. Um, but that's something to consider at the beginning of your range planning and your strate strategic sort of um, insight meeting to make sure that you're putting your uh, eggs in enough baskets, <laughs> if, you, if you like. Um, Germany, actually, from our data where we've looked at um, this um, 
this kind of analysis and published it on our retail reports. Germany seems to be a country that has really kind of pioneered the way here. Um, so there's in stock products that are made domestically have risen 68%, um, which is obviously really kind of channeling um, them in the right direction. Um, another thing, as well as I mentioned earlier, is kind of um, working on newness of um, replens or newness of repeating of old orders and pre-orders. Um, but it's really important to just make sure you're considering how all of these aspects will impact your range planning and keep an eye on what other retailers are doing too. So how is it impacting external competitors and how are they um, reacting? Um, is it just that they're launching more um, less newness per week and doing more monthly drops? Um, are they increasing prices or is it just about the fact that they are trying to keep stock levels high and newness at a stable amount too? So that's what you can use edited for um, to make your plan as commercially viable as possible. So, Rick, a day in the life of a merchandiser then in terms of supply chain issues, um, lead times, order quantities. Have you seen a shift? What, I think what's just explained it perfectly. Yeah, exactly what exactly what we're seeing at the minute, a live example. Um, so we're seeing loads of issues where lead time is getting a lot longer. Um, more unpredictable as well, whereas in the past, you, you, sometimes you, you could find out in advance that your lead time is going to get longer, but we're seeing lots of delays while products on the water. So once a factory's already handed it over, we don't actually know when it's going to land into us. So we're, we're having those issues. So for next, when we're planning next season, do we do we plan in um, a contingency for that or do we just hope that, that you know, the issue has gone away? So we, we're seeing lots of issues around that. Um, but again, in terms of lead time and how, how to know to use closer to home, it comes back to that pyramid again. Um, we can plan out our core a lot further in advance so we can use the Far East or longer lead time a lot more for that. So black t-shirt, I could probably tell you the sales curve and not be far off for the next 12 months to two years. Same, similarly mentioned denim, men's denim. I, I can plan that out for quite a long time. And then anything that's trend-led, anything that you know we might get, we might spot a trend that's what we'll use for sort of closer to home and then there's also the cost benefit in that as well if you're using the far east for all your core commodity products then you get the cost benefit in there as well so are the suppliers sort of having quite a tough time as well as well as you having just quite a tough time very tough time yeah we've seen factories being locked down due to covid and they're having they're seeing the impact of the the fabric uh, price increases they're having to come to the buyers and explain that to the buyers and you know the buyers are obviously tough trying to negotiate those prices down um, and 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 again you know sometimes they're handing over the goods on time but it's, it's arriving to us late so they're not they're having the impact where we're not having placing the repeat orders for them so they're not getting the same level of business that they were because we've got gaps in our inventory so yeah very very tough time for the suppliers at the minute but hopefully it'll it'll iron out we have seen improvements over the last couple of months and hopefully it'll, it'll continue to get better Fab, thank you. Um, we touched a little bit before on um, inclusivity, where Sean talked about, uh, you know, uh, the sort of the skin tone offering bras, which we haven't seen uh, sort of previously. In terms of sizing, Lee, um, we've obviously seen a lot more in inclusive sizing, but how would you think about sizing in relation to your range? Obviously, um, retailers have specific size offer normally. And is there anything other considerations you might think about in sizing? So I had an interesting uh, project where I was working with a rebrand for a fast um, fashion brand basically in Australia. Um, so they basically rebranded and complete offering of a fashion offering for a young uh, female. So their target consumer was um, 16. Um, as they started getting some hits on the board, it became quite evident that actually their target consumer was as young as 13. So that kind of flagged a lot of problems with regards to, you know, the sizing wasn't fitting a 13 year old tween, you know, body. So we talk a lot about inclusive sizing with regards to plus sizing and on the other side of the spectrum. But what we had to take into consideration for our target consumer was actually going on the other side of the spectrum and offering those really small sizes as well. So I think that's really important to, you know, bear in mind when you're actually you know, designing product and thinking about the size ranging as well. You have to be inclusive to include all types of body sizes. Great. And we have seen some really great examples of inclusive size and in terms of marketing and things like that, which has been fantastic to see. Fab. Um, Bethany, if we think about um, 
range planning in relation to online and bricks and mortar. Are there any different considerations for, for in these areas when you're range planning? Mm -hmm. Of course, I, yeah, there are different considerations. I, I guess the main one, um, tracking back to my merchandising days in store, was allocation of store stock. Um, so the ranking of products by store would always be a consideration. You would have tiers, so all of your stores would be put into specific tiers, and you would plan the buy of each line based on those tiers. Often the I guess the talking point would be is that is that style is that product commercial in all of the different areas or regions that your stores sit in um so I guess that's the main difference is that allocation topic the tiering topic and that ranking idea um but what I would say is that the approach is always the same and data is the way forward with this so again utilizing market analytics and market insights can really help you position your range in the best way possible online and offline um, so for those who don't know edited specializes in data from e-commerce but since the pandemic we've seen more retailers operating and adopting omni-channel strategies than ever before um, i think a lot of retailers are realizing that um, digital is the way to focus. In fact, most retailers we work with, their main business objective is either doubling or tripling their e-commerce business in the next three years. So that just proves to you how important digital really is in, in our kind of market as it is right now. Um, I think the sales online in the UK alone doubled from 19% to 37% over the pandemic year, which is incredible. Um, so yeah, it really means that real-time market update updates, um, access to data, and visibility of these omni-channel patterns, which you can get through edited, is integral. Um, I think as well where it's been really beneficial and I think where market data can support both online and offline strategies is the fact that a lot of buyers haven't been able to get out comp shopping and a lot of um, well suppliers alike and buyers themselves haven't been able to travel across countries to do regional shopping so if you have stores that are in France if you have stores that are in Germany you may not have been able to go on the streets to see what the trends are but using market data you can go in and see if there's any difference in sellouts difference in um, trending products or different in characteristics of those of those regions um, so that's something I would like I would point out as well um, but yeah really in terms of like that first analysis point of view when you're looking internally is that difference in allocation versus um, having the stock to play around with on digital is a lot easier. Fab okay that's great. Lee just just touching on that point then around trend research and you know lockdown and not being able to get out to stores and things like that how have you have you managed that digitally for your trend research? Yeah, I think it's it's been, you know, a, a big challenge because that is a massive part of being a trend forecaster is being able to travel and see different, um, you know, trends evolving and what people are wearing on the street. So we've kind of been locked down to actually been only being able to view things on, you know, trend sites um, and with people on the street, there hasn't been any people on the street. So it's been really difficult to actually understand what the trends are. It's kind of like they've almost paused for a moment. And now that everyone's coming back, we're seeing like a massive jump in trends. But I think one of the major channels that's really escalated from a fast fashion perspective is TikTok. So with the relevance of TikTok, for one example, there was an influencer that posted a viral outfit on TikTok, and it was a very basic outfit of a pair of flared yoga, yoga pants um, and a non-core sweat. And it basically created a style movement where young girls were trying to emulate this look, um, which really led to like a need and a want for these yoga flared, you know, black bottoms, which is very basic product. But from our perspective, that's when we have to kind of, you know, move immediately because it's it's happening now. They don't want it in six months. So for things like that, we would set aside, you know, a lot of greyish fabric with our suppliers that's in our base fabrics that we can really work into a style. If we can get it in early and get it online, test and respond. And then if it does well, we can actually, you know, fit it into the range and bring it into our bricks and mortar stores. So it's just, it's the real escalation of, 
you know, where we had fast fashion impact, you know, range planning from that perspective with the influence of Instagram and TikTok now that's really escalated and it's just so, so fast. With regards to, you know, graphics as well, it's something that we've like had a lot of our core basic um, blank t-shirts. We've had them shipped and put into a local uh, warehouse so that we can work with local screen printers. So if there's something of the moment that we want to do a graphic that's really relevant to Gen Z or our consumer, we can print them locally and get them into store within a week, um, not six months down the line when whatever we're trying to say is the message through the graphic or the moments past. So that's been a real challenge as well, but it's something that's worked and has been able to keep us relevant um, with the speed. That's interesting. So your grey is your undyed fabric, isn't it? And obviously Correct. having these sort of just these key silhouettes, which we see as quite core, cool, can become very fashionable depending on what you print on them or depending on what graphics you use. That's really interesting. So in terms of fast fashion and changing the range planning process, is it is it more about um, more drops, more frequent drops? And how have you found that as a sort of somebody trying to bring trends and newness in all the time? I think it's a massive challenge with regards to um, planners because they want to plan everything up front. Um, and I think that Open Dubai now has, has like basically grown as such a big area. So we can plan everything up front. We have to have that openness. So the Open Dubai area is something we really need to play around with. We've seen that seasonality has really dropped off as well with regards to, you know, you can't just bring something in six months later that's going to sell for a season. You need to react to something really quickly. Um, so I think it's really important, you know, that you have to, you know, work with the speed um, in order to get the right product in at the right time. So if that means that it's not bringing in a whole theme for, you um, a full season or a quarter it's more about frequent drops of you know different product to add newness in there on a weekly or fortnightly basis Fab. sean could i just ask you a quick question in terms of yeah. otb would you maybe just mind explaining that from a merch perspective and and how yeah. much otb is in a range etc yeah so otb is open to buy which is basically so we we kind of define it as kind of your pocket money almost at the end of what you would have uh, at the end of your range. So you'd have a sign off and say, for instance, you're selling off, uh, signing off a range for £10 million in terms of demand sales. You might keep a small percentage of that back. So um, you may keep possibly even a million pounds of that back in terms of what Lee was saying, get, but getting back into that, uh, the newness or the trend pieces in season. So swimwear is a good example of that, for instance, uh, in terms of just different colorways that we may see within a season. We, might, we may kind of open up the season with our um, nine million pounds that we've committed to, but then within the season, we've used that extra pot of money or you know, the change that we've got left in our, in our pocket money to go, go out and buy the key pieces that we've seen across the market and turn them round with back to Rick's point earlier, more near East suppliers. So you can't always guarantee that you're going to get it from your initial source. So we do have uh, a certain few of more near East suppliers, whether that be Turkey or even the likes of Bangladesh or Pakistan, which can turn things around quicker than China, just due to sailing times and actually having the fabric there ready uh, for us. But, um, it's having that that pot of money back that you can really start to trade a range and get that you know that initial thought is like de-risking almost in a way as well. So that initial bit of where we were kind of banking off that eighty percent that I said in terms of the pyramid, that that five or ten percent at the bottom, you want to make sure that that's as safe as possible. That you're going to kind of put your money down on that. Um, so it's just keeping that little little uh, pocket of money back to go out and spend on exactly what you want to. Yeah, and it's that newness that Lee talked about, isn't it? It's giving yeah. you, you can it's, shoot. From that's it. It's always, it always tends to be newness. It's never it's never back to that core piece. It's never really on core because, as we've said previously, you plan your core out, you know, season in, season out. It's always that trend or your newness, uh, just based on what we're seeing on socials or, you know, through market data or um, even like think new things like TikTok. You've, you've got yeah. to stay all over those because the next one might be out tomorrow. <laughs> So Rick, um, what what would frustrate you the most as a merchandise merchandiser? What would frustrate you about your design or your buying team? Uh, difficult if question. 
difficult question. They always want to buy more. There's never enough in the range. They always want to buy more. They always want more money. They, they think there's a, the bottomless pot of money, so they, they can't stick to a budget. It would be my most frustrating thing. Uh, you'll sign off a range, and they'll always go out and see something new that they want to bring in, which is perfectly the right thing to do. And if I was a buyer, I'd be exactly the same. You know, you you want to you want to grow your range, but we've got to keep those guardrails on and make sure that we don't overspend and don't over option. So we're we're always the bad guys that won't won't give up any money so that's the most frustrating thing i would say and lee would you agree what's the most frustrating thing about the merchandiser not giving you the money <laughs> um yeah definitely that but also i've come up against um a lot of um a kind of old school way of planning and buying so they've always over optioned and overstocked a lot of the bricks and mortar stores so a big backlash of from my perspective from trend and design is you know we're dealing with a gen z consumer so anytime they see a store that's got a table at the front of the store piled high with bog off offers they just see that as landfill so you're not actually giving them an experience and an, an understanding of what your brand is about because they don't want to see things that are piled high and they're not going to fly out the door anymore so i think that's been my biggest frustration is that less is actually more now from your consumer's perspective and it's all about the experience of actually going into the store and shopping and you don't want to walk into a store that's claustrophobic with stock so it's about that experience and having those unique pieces in there. Uh, we've got a great question from Jasmine Hatch, actually. How are consumers' growing desire for sustainable product affected developing a range? So if, you, if you're trying to develop a, a more sustainable product, how do you balance that cost with satisfying consumer needs? Bethany, do you want to have a, a stab at that? Yeah, I think that's a great question, actually. And it's something um, that we are always um, looking at as a data company, but also in retail as well. Um, I think it really comes back to that price versus value um, balance, right? And understanding whether the customer is at that point where they're ready to invest in that quality, sustainable piece, or whether they're still seeing it as a cost. Um, so a lot of retailers actually use Edited to kind of get a steer on what are kind of the key marketing campaigns that are being delivered by retailers to kind of promote this um i think as well what might be interesting coming up which will be um i guess good to see how it plays out is the rise of raw material costs is impacting the whole um retail industry so we you might actually see that retailers are more i guess inclined to invest in sustainable products because the difference isn't so severe in initial cost so we've already seen a lot of retailers are investing a lot higher in mixes of hemp lyocell and tensile in denim so that might be quite interesting to see how it plays out and i think in general retailers often want to make sure that their pricing strategy is as narrow a gap in between sustainable ranges and non-sustainable and of course that would be um, worked out at initial stage as a merchandiser, as a team, as to where you can afford to take a margin hit based on having a more expensive product initially and where, where you can kind of make that margin up in other areas. Um, I just said a lot of things there, but there's lots of things to consider. I'm not sure if anyone else has this from real time perspective, but that's what we see on edited side that people are trying to work out those pricing gaps between ranges. Yeah, definitely. I'd just add to that because we, we are certainly looking at that and that's one of our key KPIs going forward because we are uh, looking at reviewing our sustainable uh, package. Uh, so we have committed by the end of the financial year 22, so next March, that our exit rate will be 30% sustainable or 30 percent sustainable. It's easy for me to say. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, that target for us is 30% of products. Um, so we really need to go after that and we do look on course to hit that. Uh, but we've also done things such as um, entering membership to the BCI, which is the Better Cotton Initiative. Um, so that means that we'll source 50% of our own brand cotton through those certificate, uh, certified routes even um, to make sure that that is from the, the most sustainable sources. And then just in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions as well. So uh, we've actually seen a 35% reduction by the end of this year from where we'd uh, baselined it two years ago. Um, so we are monitoring that as a business in terms of where, where we source our product, but also targeting our ranges by that 30% initiative as well. 
so it's definitely at the forefront of uh, everyone's mind but that is a great question and Lee, in terms of the, uh, you know, from a trend perspective, you've seen a lot of trends for sustainability coming through as well. I think it's really interesting from a colour perspective. So a lot of colours like unbleached, undyed, raw, um, off-white, things like that are trending really high. And it's probably because of Gen Z's consideration to the planet and trying to cut back on the use of water and chemical dyes. So we see a lot of brands that are trying to play around with plant dyes, plant-based dyes. Um, and I think we can see a lot of like pastel rather than those kind of chemical bright colors that we've seen in a lot of ranges in the past. So I think it's really interesting from a color perspective and as a fast fashion retailer as well, trying to cut down and dropping, you know, different color palettes every single quarter or every single, you know, month. Um, I think we'll see a, more of a continuation of these kind of core colors um, that are more friendly to the environment rather than, you know, a season that's full of really, really bright colors and prints um, from that perspective. It's great to see it's all coming through. Um, I'm just going to ask all the panel the final question, but just before I do, just a reminder there are three o'clock, you can, um, the link in the chat there for the post networking event, if you want to have a further discussion, should be really great if you want to do that. Um, so I guess final thoughts in terms of the future of range planning. So Rick, any thoughts in, you know, the future? Um, in terms of how you how you'll approach range planning, any changes? etc we're certainly getting closer to the season um closer to home looking at trends so i, I mean i've come from a background i'm again i'm menswear so i'm very core cool and I've, I've i've been used to planning out two years in advance that's just not happening anymore you know we need to be a lot closer to the season seeing what trends are coming through what shapes grew even on menswear so even more so on ladies wear i, I think that's the biggest sort of change I'm seeing at the moment. And then again, the sustainability thing, uh, that's that's massive, making sure that we're, we're seeing that through and that's coming through. Okay, thanks. Bethany, your thoughts? Yeah, sustainability is obviously a huge um, comment, but of course I'm gonna say data is the way forward for the future of range planning. So external data is only gonna help you optimize your strategies and that's what uh, we can provide it edited. So I think less than 20% of retailers use AI at the moment to fill in the gaps of their industry knowledge. Um, and yeah, I think it's just important to be ahead of the pack, know what your competitors are doing and optimize your own um, assortment and marketing pricing strategies further with data. Have Sean? Yeah, just echo the pair of those. To be honest, it is. It's that you know, sustainable is not going to go away, and rightly so. Uh, I think that will stay with us for the next you know x amount of years. Uh, but data as well, I agree. You know, you always need to make sure that you're keeping an eye on what your competitors are doing, not to let uh, kind of gain any traction or lose any momentum with any of your your brands or your your profile. So, uh, just always keeping an eye on your competition and also keeping that open to buy pot on exactly what's going to be hot in that season is key as well but the, the key to that is keeping your stocks down so improving your stock health all the time throughout this throughout the season uh, you've got to trade that to have the open to buy so um but to, to be able to trade you need your brand awareness so it is back to that competitor set and you know what is going on in in the world at the minute how how best can you trade your range so is it really about agility in terms of what you're doing and your reaction and that and that ability to be agile? Exactly, because even, you know, six months ago, even throughout the pandemic, did we think that we'd see such freight issues that we're seeing even now? No, probably not. So it's just it's constantly being able to react to the, the next challenge that's thrown at you. Lee, in terms of you, the future of range planning, what, what are your challenges or thoughts? I think I'd like to throw it back to the, the poll. So art or science. Um, and I was really happy to see that it was pretty close um, because I feel it's definitely both. Um, I feel that it's really important from a data perspective now, but I also feel that there's still an art to it. And I still feel that there needs to be that human connection or emotional connection that can guide those data because I, I think without one or the other, none of them is going to actually work. So I think it's important that there's the impact of both art and science. Yeah, and it's interesting, isn't it? Because obviously from a design and a creative perspective, the, the art is very much there. And then from the um, merch perspective, it's very much about the science. So is it science meets art, guys? Is that what it is? 
Yeah, I definitely said beforehand, I did click on science, obviously, um, purely just being a numbers guy. But yeah, I nearly had splinters sitting on the fence, really, because you do need that that bit of both. You definitely need that uh, the, the um, that feel and, you know, that trend, like Lee says. So in terms of the, the, the buying team, the buying, the merch, you know, and all those guys, is it really about, you know, are you, you're all working to the same goal? Do you think... Uh, sort of designers, buyers, merch, all have an appreciation of the value, for example, merch put on um, science and the value that design put on uh, the art side. Is this is this the compromise? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is very much a one team one team goal. Um, obviously, that you know the buying side are really passionate about products, but you know me and Rick are really passionate about hitting our stock targets. So it's kind of it's always that way in scale. So, uh, but yeah, the, you know, by the end, you you know you will make the the perfect range if you all come together as a team. Yeah, Bethany, any final thoughts? Yeah, I. Was- I was going to say collaboration is key, right? Um, I think when you can collaborate as a team, obviously you're going to produce the best range. And I think where I see where I see real success and where I see embedded success in the retailers I work with, it's where the gut instinct and that emotional connection is backed up by data. Um, and that's when the best decisions are made. And I think um, just going back to your point, Lisa, on agility, speed to insight, especially now where teams are, teams are lean, not lean's a team, teams are lean (laughs) and um things are changing constantly having that um i guess pulse in the i guess that finger pulse in the market with data can really support you and make you feel confident in any decisions that you're making yeah so it's like your friend isn't it data is your friend really yeah (laughs) okay thanks so much to our panel that was really insightful um so we've just a couple of minutes to go i don't know if there's any last minute questions but otherwise we'll uh We'll, we'll, well, thank you, first of all, for joining the Fashion Network for this range planning masterclass. And hopefully we'll see you in a few minutes in the networking event. Please do engage in that because a chance to, um, you know, have more of a discussion with the panel. So thanks so much, everybody.